Hello everyone, welcome to National Daily Analysis and UPSC Topic Analysis. So today on 2nd of November 2000 and, uh, like 2020, we are going to analyze some important topic for UPSC prelims and mains examination. Okay. So the topics that we are going to understand today are International Press Institute, then we will learn about Himalayan Brown Beer, then we will learn about the Shivalik Elephant Reserve. Then we will understand code on wages and its relations with sexual harass uh, harassment at workplace okay, or sexual harassment in general. Then we will understand about translocation of corals. Okay, so these are the topics that we will understand today. So let us look into the first topic for the day, which is International Press Institute. Okay, we will understand about International Press Institute. We will see why International Press Institute was in news and what is its significance in the present uh, timing. Okay, so why it was in news? Because recently the International Press Institute has highlighted that impunity with which crimes against journalists are committed continued to rise as, as governments had failed to probe the cases. Okay, so we need to understand what, what is the meaning of the term impunity and how it is associated with crimes. Impunity means like people who commit crimes with impunity, they are the people who go unnoticed and they go like, uh, you know, uh, like they walk free without any kind of punishment for the uh, for the crimes that they have done. Okay, so sometimes what happens when impunity with crimes is associated in that case, people walk free and those people become fearless and they continue to do crime, which creates the society you know like vulnerable to criminals okay then criminals started uh, start acquiring higher positions in the society okay so that's why the international press institute has highlighted that the impunity with crimes against journalists are committed uh, are committed and they continue to rise as the governments have failed to probe the cases probe means investigate the cases okay so a government failed to investigate the cases so this is the logo that you can see of international press institute okay so its tagline is defending press freedom since 1950 okay so it is 70th year since its constitution it is 70th year of international press institute okay it is 70th year of international press institute and here like they say that no prison is big enough to contain free speech it means like you know they strongly advocate free speech throughout the globe okay so it is very important to uphold the freedom of speech okay as you know like freedom of speech and expression is one of the fundamental rights under the fundamental rights that are guaranteed in the constitution of india so in this respect we will understand about what international press, uh, press institute is and we will understand what are the highlights related to this particular move that has been taken by the international press institute okay so let us see about international press institute so international press institute is a vienna based global network of editors media executives and leading journalists okay so it is located in vienna okay it is vienna based global network of editors media executives and leading journalists who share a common dedication to equality independent journalism okay and if we talk about formation of this particular institute okay international press institute so in 1950 to promote and protect press freedom and to improve the practices of journalism 34 editors from 15 countries gathered at California University and formed the global organization. Okay, so 34 editors from 15 countries gathered at the California, uh, so, uh, sorry, Columbia University. Okay, it is Columbia University and formed the global organization. And the year 2020 marks its 70th anniversary. Okay, so the thing is, it was uh, like 70th anniversary is today, which is 2nd of November. Okay, 2nd of November 2020. Okay, so this is the thing. Now, the 
original secretariat was set up in 1951 in Zurich which is located in Switzerland which was then shifted to London in 1976 and then to Vienna in 1992 and now its headquarters is located in Vienna okay its head headquarters is located in Vienna so having understood about the International Press Institute let us see what are the objectives of International Press Institute its objectives are to promote conditions that allow journalism to fulfill its public function the most important of which is the media's ability to operate free from interference and without fear of retaliation okay retaliation means if a reporter reports something let's consider there is a reporter he's reporting something okay so against maybe a influential person maybe a politician maybe a bureaucrat so the thing is those politicians those bureaucrats may have some tendency to you know retaliate against the report that was published by this journalist okay so the thing is one of the objective of the international press institute is to you know is to make the society such that you know the media reports by the journalist you know should not be uh, like you know journalists should not be under the fear that if i report something so uh, i may face some retaliation maybe a threat to life okay so this is the thing then to defend media freedom and to free flow of news wherever they are threatened okay now the uh, we have recently talked about that they have uh, they have highlighted you know that impunity of crimes that are being uh, done okay it goes unnoticed and unproved by the government so what does that particular move you know uh, like signifies so this move comes ahead of the international day to end Im impunity for crimes against journalists okay international day to end impunity for crimes against journalists which is celebrated on 2nd of november every year okay so the thing is 2nd of november is the international day to end impunity for crimes against journalists okay then the united nations general assembly proclaimed the day in the general assembly resolution of december 2013 it urged the member states to implement definite measures countering the culture of impunity and the date was chosen in commemoration of the assassination of two french journalists in mali on 2nd of november 2013 if you want to understand more on this topic you can follow this reference link from the international press, uh, press institute itself so having understood the first topic let us move to the next topic for the day which is himalayan brown beer okay or bear so we are going to understand about Himalayan brown bear. So why it was a news? Because a recent study which was conducted by the scientists of the Geological Survey of India on the Himalayan brown bear, okay, its scientific name is Ursus artos isabellinus, okay, Ursus artos isabellinus. This is the scientific name of himalayan brown beer okay so these scientists from geological survey of india has predicted a significant reduction in the suitable habitat and biological corridors of the himalayan brown bear due to climate change habitat means the place where the brown bear reside okay so this is considered to be habitat where the brown bears are naturally found okay and biological corridors corridors are the place through which you know these uh, like brown bears move from one one habitat to another habitat okay so the thing is they have predicted that the significant reduction in, su uh, in suitable habitat and biological corridors of the himalayan brown bear due to climate change okay so they uh, they have identified or they have predicted that due to climate change there may be significant reduction in the habitat of brown bear and biological corridors so uh, this is the image of a brown bear himalayan brown bear and uh, this shows the places where himalayan brown bears are found so in india it is found over here okay in the western himalayas okay now so uh, this is an infographic that i have included for your understanding okay so it talks about himalayan brown bear so it is india's largest land carnivore okay carnivore is an animal okay that feeds upon some other animal okay so it is uh, india's largest land carnivore but shy and fearful of humans why shy and fearful of humans because humans poach upon bears okay so 
poach means they kill bears for uh, uh, you know they hunt for some commercial purposes and at the same time they encroach upon the habitat of the brown bear okay so the thing is uh, you you can read this particular infographic okay which family they come from what is what are the conservation measures that are taken you know like in india and globally okay so these are the things mentioned in this particular infographic now what are the threats that they face habitat degradation okay poaching for trade in uh, trade in gall bladder other bear parts okay then retaliatory killing by livestock grazers if bears kill livestock okay then included in international legislation also okay this is the thing now let us understand key points related to this particular study that was conducted by the scientist okay so the study title this is the title of the study adaptive spatial planning of protected area networks for conserving the Himalayan brown bear, okay, adaptive, uh, adaptive spatial planning of protected area networks for conserving the Himalayan brown bear, it was carried out in the western Himalayas and it has predicted a decline of about 73% of bears habited by the year of 2050. So they have predicted that we may see about 73% of the bears habited by the year 2050. The total habitat loss can make 8 out of 13 protected areas completely uninhabited by 2050. So at present we have 13 protected areas for brown bear and we, we may see that by 2015, uh, by 2050, 5-0, 8 out of 13 protected areas may completely be uninhabited, means their population may vanish okay, from these 8 protected areas. The western Himalayas where significant brown bear population is distributed is most vulnerable to global warming as this elevation belt is getting warmer faster and other than other elevated zones of the Himalayas. Okay. Now to keep a check on this scientists have recommended okay, preemptive spatial planning of protected areas in the Himalayan region for long term viability of the species okay the spatial planning of the protected areas is aimed at minimizing the risk and uncertainty of the climate change okay what do we mean by spatial planning okay spatial planning is an activity which is centered on making decisions related to the location and distribution of land use activities it allows monitoring of changes both in climate and socio economic situations okay if you want to learn more on this news item you can follow this link from the hindu okay now having understood this topic let us understand about uh, like you know some conservation status of brown bear okay range means the places okay the places where the brown bear moves or they they are found okay so they are found in the northwestern and central himalayas okay including india pakistan nepal the tibetan autonomous region of china and bhutan okay so it is found in these countries india pakistan nepal tibetan autonomous region of china and bhutan so this is found in five different jurisdictions okay if we talk about habitat high altitude open valleys and pastures okay it is found in high altitude open valleys and pastures what are the conservation status under the iucn international union for conservation of nature under the IUCN red list it is placed at critically endangered that under sites we uh, it is included in appendix one then in Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 it is again included in schedule one okay so IUCN critically endangered sites appendix one Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 schedule one okay so it has been given granted highest you know or like highest uh, protection status and at the same time they face the highest level of threat okay then what are the foods that they eat they are omnivorous omnivorous means like they eat everything they eat plants they eat animals okay like that they are omnivorous herbivorous plus carnivorous means omnivorous okay omnivorous means herbivorous herbivorous plus carnivorous carnivorous means eating upon 
other animals okay herbivores plus carnivorous mix omnivorous okay what are the threats that the himalayan brown bear face threats constitute human and animal conflict rapid habitat loss poaching for fur claws and organs and in some rare cases bear biting okay bear baiting now so let us understand the next topic for the day which is shivalik elephant reserve okay recently the shivalik elephant reserve from the state of uttarakhand was in news so it is there in the state of uttarakhand okay uttarakhand okay so why it was in news because recently the ministry of environment forest and climate change has asked the uttarakhand government to consider avoiding sensitive areas of Shiv uh, shivalik elephant reserve while exploring land suitable for, to use for the expansion of dehradun's jolly grant airport okay so uttarakhand government is exploring land that uh, that they can utilize for expansion of dehradun's jolly grant airport that's why ministry of environment forest and climate change has asked the uttarakhand government to consider avoiding sensitive areas that are part of the shivalik elephant reserve that's why it was in news now if we see over here if we see over here it shows the map of northern portion of india you can see over here this is the state of uttarakhand and this is shivalik okay so this shivalik elephant corridor is over here okay now i have included another map for you over here so this talks about himalayan belt okay this rajaji national park is located at the foothills of the shivalik elephant corridor we will talk about this thing also and the thing is the black dotted areas in this particular map these uh, these are the areas where we can find the asian elephant and as you know recently in the year 2020 upsc has asked a specific question related to elephants in upsc prelims 2020 examination okay so it is very important that you should be giving proper importance to the uh, to the you know uh, different animals that are coming in news okay you have to understand about their significance their level of threat okay protection uh, protection measures that the governments are taking okay like that so having understood that like why it was in news we will understand little more on this so since we are talking about elephants it is very important for us to understand project elephant okay it is very important for us to understand project elephant so project elephant was launched by the government of india in the year of 1992 as a centrally sponsored scheme with the following objectives okay so before we uh, you know enlist these objectives let us understand what do we mean by centrally sponsored scheme these are the government schemes where the central government gives significant portion of the funding to execute the project and apart from this the state governments are also considered like you know they should be also investing in those projects okay there are two types of government schemes generally okay one is centrally sponsored scheme another is central sector scheme if a scheme is central sector scheme then almost all the funding for for executing that particular project okay is 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 borne by the central government itself if it is a centrally sponsored scheme central government along with the states okay so like along with the states they together contribute you know amount in the execution of programs so the thing is it varies from a scheme to a scheme generally it is like 60% from central side 40 percent from normal states in case of normal states okay in case of normal states then we have uh, you know 90 into 10 percent uh, okay in case of uh, hilly areas hilly states hilly and northeastern states in case of hilly and northeastern states the funding pattern is generally 19 to 10, uh, 10. 90 is central uh, share and 10 is state share here again central uh, central government share and state government share like that okay in case of normal states 
central government generally gives 60 percent of the funding and respective state governments contribute 40 percent of the funding in case of northeastern and hilly states central government constitutes 90 percent and state government constitutes 10 percent it may vary from a scheme to a scheme okay so it is not a general a generalized thing okay so generally this is uh, this is the pattern which is followed but for some special schemes it may vary also okay so let us see what are the objectives of project elephant okay one of the objective is to protect elephants their habitat and corridors second is to address the issue of man animal conflict third is welfare of captive elephants captive elephants means those elephants that are not residing in their natural habitat okay they may have been relocated to certain zoos okay or or some areas where some conservation efforts may be taken for protecting those animals okay captive means under cap captivity means like we have kept them in certain pro protective regimes some places okay where we can protect them but they are not in their natural habitat okay so the project is being implemented in 16 states and uni or union territories and these 16 states or union territories are mentioned over here okay they are andhra pradesh arunachal pradesh assam Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Karnataka, Kerala, okay, Maharashtra, Meghalaya, Nagaland, okay, Maharashtra, Meghalaya, Nagaland, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, Tripura, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, and West Bengal. So these are the locations where you know the project elephant is being implemented by the government of India. Then the Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change provides the financial and technical support to major elephant range states in the country through project elephant okay so having understood the project elephant i have included a list from the you know envy center for wildlife and protected areas and this list talks about the elephant population okay so in the website they had the latest data from the year of 2013 itself and here they have mentioned about those states where they have counted the population so uh, they have counted population in 2007 and this is the you know estimated population for the uh, for 2020 uh, uh, like 12 okay so here you uh, you can see arunachal pradesh is at the top arunachal pradesh assam meghalaya nagaland tripura west bengal jharkhand so like northeastern states has the highest population of asian elephants then least population of Asian elephant is found in Maharashtra but like there are many states where elephants are not found at all okay so there are only six states and union territories where we find the population of any uh, elephants okay now having understood this we will understand about Shivalik elephant reserve okay we will understand about shivalik elephant reserve now okay so it was notified in the year 2002 under project elephant so we have recently discussed about project elephant okay so this shivalik elephant reserve was notified under project elephant in the year 2002 the project elephant was launched by the government of india in the year of 1992 as a centrally sponsored scheme okay so we had already learned about these you know uh, these objectives of the project elephant then we have Kansora Barcourt Elephant Corridor is located near to it. Okay, this place is very important. You should remember the name. The Kansora Barcourt Elephant Corridor. Okay, it is very important. Then I had shown you on a map, okay, Rajaji National Park. Let us understand about Rajaji National Park. Where it is located? It is located in Hari, uh, Haridwar, okay, along the foothills of Shivalik Range. And it, it spans, okay, 800 and 20 square kilometers what is the background three sanctuaries in Uttarakhand they are Rajaji, Motichur and Chila were amalgamated into a large protected area named Rajaji National Park in the year of 1983 after the famous freedom fighter Sri Rajagopala Chari popularly known as Rajaji okay so this Rajaji National Park was named after popular famous freedom fighter his name is Sri Rajagopala Chari okay now let us understand the features of this particular shivalik elephant reserve okay this area is the northwestern limit of the habitat of ancient elephants okay the forest types include salt forest riverine forest broad-leaved mixed forest 
like a scrub land and grassy land okay then it possesses as many as 23 species of mammals 315 bird species such as elephants tigers leopards deer and gorals okay it was declared a tiger reserve in 2015 then it is home to the one gujars in the winters okay one gujars in the winters one gujars are one of the few forest dwelling nomadic communities in the country okay they are one of the few forest dwelling nomadic uh, communities in the country then we have various others uh, other pro uh, protected areas in the state of Uttarakhand. they are jim corbett national park and it is the first national park of india recently the prime minister of india okay the prime minister of india and bear grills okay and bear grills okay so spare me if uh, if this spelling is you know uh, anyways you know like it, it may be wrong also so the prime minister of india and bear grills they have to uh, they have together went for a man versus wild episode in this particular area man versus wild okay episode in this particular area so jim corbett national park this is the first national park in india and it is a very important you know uh, very important protected area for tigers this is for tigers we find tigers over here okay tigers over here and you should know about tigers its conservation status how frequently the tiger census is being conducted and all it is very important topic then we have Valley of Flowers National Park and Nanda Devi National Park. Okay, Valley of Flowers National Park and Nanda Devi National Park, which together are a UNESCO World Heritage Site from the state of Uttarakhand. Then we have Bovin Pashu Bihar National Park and Sanctuary over here. Then Gangotri National Park is also located. Then Nandur Wildlife Sanctuary is also located. Okay, Nandhor Wildlife Sanctuary. So these are the other protected areas in the state of Uttarakhand. Okay. And recently the Uttarakhand was in news because like they have, you know, made two capitals for that particular state. So like one uh, will be used for winter, other will be used for summer uh, regions. So in your free time, you should, you know, locate those places and search more about that particular news item. Okay. So having understood this, let us understand some key points related to, you know, uh, the recent concern okay so there are a lot of things that we are we need to study on this thing okay background the proposed area okay so we have talked about that there is a you know area where the government of Uttarakhand is looking for expansion of a particular airport okay that is located there so the proposed area for expansion is a part of the Shivalik elephant reserve and it falls within a 10 kilometer radius of Rajaji National Park Second, people are protesting against it. Children and social activists have tied protective strings around the trees marked to be cut. Okay, similar to the Chipko movement of 1970s, when villagers in this Chamoli hut trees to stop contractors from felling them. Then what are the concerns associated with this? The expansion will threaten hundreds of species of fauna in Thano near near Rajaji National Park and Elephant Corridor nearby. This state also falls in seismic zone 4 and 5. Seismic zones are those places where the uh, you know probability of occurrence of an earthquake is very high. These are earthquake prone regions. Okay, So this state also falls in seismic zone 4 and 5 as per the earthquake zoning map. And uprooting Thano will lead to soil erosion, a factor that X exacerbated the 2013 Kedarnath floods endangering countless lives okay so this is the thing so earlier the social activist had criticized Chardham Pariyojana on environmental grounds okay and if you talk about what is Chardham Pariyojana it is a program taken up by the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways for connectivity improvement for Chardham Chardham includes Kedarnath, Vadrinath Yamnotri and Gangotri in Uttarakhand. Okay. Chardham includes Kedarnath, Badrinath, Yamnotri and Gangotri in Uttarakhand. So recently the Supreme Court upheld the 2011 order of the Madras High Court on Nilgiri's Elephant Corridor affirming the right of passage of animals and the closure of the resorts in that area. Okay. So now it is considered to, to have one of the highest densities of elephants found in India. This particular 
area rajaji national park okay this is the thing then the elephants okay their scientific name is elephas maximus occurs in the central and southwestern ghats northeastern india central india northern india and in some parts of southern peninsular india okay so we have recently conducted elephant census in the year of 2017 under that karnataka has the highest population of indian elephants earlier the list that we have seen that list showed that highest elephant was in arunachal pradesh but that was in the year of 2007 okay but now according to the census elephant census of 2017 the recent data shows that karnataka has the highest population of indian elephants and indian elephants is included in schedule 1 of the indian wildlife protection act okay it is included in schedule 1 of the indian wildlife protection act and appendix 1 of the convention on international trade in endangered species of flora and fauna in short it is known as sites and it is an endangered it is endangered as per the iucn red list okay so it is very important that you should be learning about the categories of protection or the threat level that they are facing okay so under wta uh, wildlife protection act wpa 1972 it is in schedule 1 and under iucn red list it is in endangered category so what is the way forward how you know how it should be uh, uh, how the government should move further though the expansion project is of strategic importance the government needs to remember that shivalik elephant reserve is a biodiversity hub of uttarakhand home to elephants leopards and endless other avian and mammal species the government therefore passing law should consider that india is on bo on board global climate agreements like united nations framework convention on climate change and kyoto protocol implying that it has some international commitments also So, if you want to learn more, you can follow this link from Indian Express. Okay, having understood this topic, let us move to the fourth topic for the day. Okay, this is also going to be a little big topic. Okay, but it is very important topic. Okay, for analysis for the mains exam. Okay, so we are going to understand about code on wages and sexual harassment. Okay, we will understand how code on wages and sexual harassment are related. Okay, interrelated. Okay, so why it was in news? Because according to a provision on code on wages. 2019 conviction for sexual harassment can be a ground for denying bonus payouts to employees okay so if there is a employee who is working in a particular establishment and if that particular employee is found uh, is convicted for doing sexual harassment then that particular employee okay can be denied bonus payouts by the employer okay so this is a provision or a provision which is there on code on wages 2019 as you know recently labor laws have been amended in india they have brought you know more than 44 labor laws that were earlier in place to four different codes so one of those codes is code on wages in in later course of discussion today we will understand in detail about code on wages okay so let us understand more the central government published draft code a code on wages central rules 2020 in july 2020 and placed it in public domain inviting objections and suggestions okay so central government has placed it in the public domain and has invited objections and suggestions on this topic let us understand some key points related to it okay some key points related to it the court lays down norms for annual bonus dues that accrue to the employees replacing the payment of bonus act 1965 which bars bonus dues only in case of fraud violent conduct and theft or sabotage okay you know fraud what do we mean by fraud violent conduct means someone is you know hitting someone else like that okay theft okay sabotage means damaging of property okay if someone damages uh, property of a particular establishment and that someone happens to be an employee of that particular establishment so the employer or that particular organization may deny payment of bonus to that particular employee okay so the thing is the code on wages lays down okay norms related to annual bonus okay and it replaces payment of bonus act 1965 Now, if we talk about payment of bonus at 1965, the minimum bonus payable is 8.3 percent of the salary or wage earned by the employee during the 
accounting year subject to maximum of 20% of such salary or wage okay so let's consider there is an employee whose uh, i mean like whose salary is is 20000 per month okay 20000 per month so so in that case you know in a year like if you if you multiply it by 12 we will get his annual salary so the minimum bonus should be 8.33 percent of his annual salary or at max it can be 20% uh, of his annual salary okay so this is uh, like this is what is was mentioned in the payment of bonus act 1965 and is applicable to all employees earning a salary of, of up to rupees 21000 per month okay so there is a limit also you know those employees who earn 21000 per month as uh, as salary so they should be getting bonus as per the payment of bonus at 1965 apart from this we will understand some relevant provisions of this particular you know uh, code so section 29 of the code okay section 29 of the recent code which is code on wages we are talking about code on wages okay section 60, uh, 29 of the code states that notwithstanding anything contained in this code an employee shall be disqualified from receiving bonus under this code if he is dismissed from service of fraud for fraud or riotous or violent behavior while on the premise uh, premises of the establishment or theft misappropriation or sabotage of any property of the establishment or conviction for sexual harassment okay then the salary and bonus payment limits are yet to be notified under the code on wages okay salary and bonus payment limits are yet to be notified then other dis uh, disqualification triggers are explicitly restricted to actions on an employer's premises the trigger uh, trigger conferring on conviction under sexual harassment does not include such a condition about the location of the incident means like under the recent norm so it is not necessary that like uh, an employee must uh, you know must have done that sexual harassment act at the workplace itself if that particular employee has done sexual harassment uh, you know with some other employee of the same organization outside the workplace in that case also the payment of uh, you know bonus can be denied to that particular employee okay so what is the significance of this move okay so this is a huge step to get people to be on their best behavior in the workplace as prospects of losing one's benefit may make employees more careful in their conduct and this is also a step forward towards creating seriousness about instances of sexual harassment at the workplace and in general okay this move will serve as an additional deterrent deterrent means like it will stop people for acting you know in such a manner that can be termed as sexual harassment okay so this move serves as an additional deterrent apart from the prevention of sexual harassment law 2013 okay so in short it is known as pohs okay prevention of sexual harassment pohsh law so let us understand about code on wages okay in detail so it may take you know like five to ten minutes for me to finish code on wages it is very important provision the new wage uh, the new wage code removes the multiplicity of wage definitions what it does it removes the multiplicity of wage definitions okay it removes the multiplicity of wage definitions which can significantly reduce litigation as well as compliance cost for employers then it links minimum wages across the country to the skills of the employee and the place of employment okay so minimum wages are linked with the skills of the employee and the place of employment okay then it seeks to universalize the provisions of minimum wage and their timely payment to all employees irrespective of the sector and wage ceiling okay it also seeks to ensure right to sustenance for every worker and, in, and intends to increase the legislative uh, protection of minimum wage a national floor level wage okay will be set up by the center and minimum wages can be set by the state governments and state government uh, the minimum wages set by state governments cannot be lower than the national floor level wage that is set by the center okay and this particular code on wages 2019 it subsumes the following four labor laws 
What are those labor laws? Payment of Wages Act 1936, Minimum Wages Act 1948, Payment of Bonus Act 1965, and Equal Renumeration Act 1976. So, this particular code on wages subsumes, means like brings under itself these four earlier laws. Okay, earlier these four laws were uh, in place related to payment of wages. But now all these, you know, all these laws have been subsumed, means like brought under the umbrella law, which is known as code on wages act 2019. Then we will talk about prevention of sexual harassment law 2013. So under it, sexual harassment includes any one of the following unwelcome acts or behavior. Okay, what does sexual harassment includes? We are talking about that thing. Physical contact or advances, demand or request for sexual favors, making sexually colored remarks, showing pornography, any other unwelcome physical, verbal or non-verbal conduct of sexual nature. Okay, so this constitutes prevention of sexual harassment okay so the thing is this constitutes sexual harassment and under the prevention of sexual harassment law these are the identified areas of sexual harassment okay then as per the prevention of sexual harassment okay uh, law it guidelines that farms are required to form an internal complaints committee okay so every farm and organization are required to form an internal complaints committee to inquire into complaints of sexual harassment at workplace the internal complaints committee is required to make recommendations to employers on the action required pursuant to its inquiry in such complaints okay if the internal complaints committee upholds a complaint it could be interpreted as a conviction and icc icc means internal complaints committee has the powers to decide if someone is guilty and report it further to the police though not all sexual harassment cases translate into police case okay this is the thing then we have a reference link for you from the hindu you can follow it to see what is there in news i have discussed it in detail much detail so the thing is this is just for your reference purpose okay so having talked about you know the fourth topic let us now talk the uh, talk about the next topic for the day which is translocation of corals okay translocation translocation means movement from one place a place to place b like if something is being moved that is known as translocation so what we are moving we are moving corals okay why we are moving corals right and what are corals we are going to see now okay we will talk about mineral accretion technology which is associated with corals we will talk about coral bleaching we will talk about great barrier reef so there are a lot to discuss in this particular topic this is a very important topic for prelims and means exam for upsc and corals is a very important topic for the exam okay so let us understand why it was in news the national institute of oceanography okay will carry out the translocation of 18 coral colonies from the coast of Mumbai for the Mumbai Coastal Road Project. Okay, so the thing is, the National Institute of Oceanography will translocate 18 coral colonies from coast of Mumbai to the Mumbai Coastal Road Project. So, what are corals? Corals are these kind of animals that are found. Okay, under the ocean, below sea. Okay, they are found in the marine areas okay so the thing is they seem to be plants they seem to be plants you can see like they look like plants but actually they are animals okay but actually they are animals and they are very colorful okay they are very vibrant colorful species that are found in the uh, in the ocean okay so we will talk about what are corals what are coral polyps what are zook xanthales okay we will talk about coral bleaching and all in detail this is a very important topic okay so i have included a map for you related to mumbai okay mumbai yeah, its earlier name was bombay so the thing is what they are doing they are translocating some of the you know like uh, like coral colonies from one place okay coast of mumbai to mumbai coastal uh, project that's the thing okay so it is near arabian sea it simply means mumbai is located to the western side of india it is a region of the state of maharashtra okay so the thing is i have included a reference link also for you from indian express 
to learn what is there in the news okay but the thing is we are going to discuss the uh, topic okay so the thing is how do we you know protect the corals so the thing is you know and and why corals are important okay so these things are included in this particular infographic okay so i am leaving this infographic for your knowledge for your understanding in your free time you can pause the video or if you have access to the pdf of this video you can you can learn from the pdf to understand more right how we protect the corals and what are the usage of corals and all okay so let us understand what are corals okay what are corals corals exhibit characteristics of plants but are marine animals and are related to jellyfish and anemones okay so the thing is they look like plants but they are marine animals this is one thing and they are made up of genetically identical organisms called polyps okay they are made up of genetically identical organisms they may be of different color they may be of different shape but they are made up of genetically identical organisms they are known as polyps which are tiny soft bodied organisms they are small and soft bodied organism means their body is very soft at their base is a hard protective limestone skeleton called the calicle okay so at their base there is protect uh, there is protective hard limestone skeleton which is known as calicle which forms the structure of the coral reefs okay so calicle forms the structure of the coral reefs so having understood this let us understand more these polyps have microscopic algae called zooxanthellae living within their tissues okay these polyps have microscopic algae okay polyps i have already told what are polyps okay so the thing is all corals are genetically identical organisms okay and uh, you know they are formed from polyps okay these polyps have microscopic algae and that microscopic algae is known as zooxanthellae that are living within their tissues okay zooxanthellae are living within the tissues of the corals okay the corals and algae have a mutualistic symbiotic relationship they have a mutualistic or they have symbiotic relationship okay so we will understand about what is mutualistic relationship mutualistic means like you know zooxanthellae and corals okay corals and um, corals and uh, corals and zooxanthellae zooxanthellae is an algae so corals you know help algae in some way and in return algae also help coral in some way so this is known as mutualistic relationship a relationship in which both of them are benefited okay the corals provides the zooxanthellae with the compounds necessary for photosynthesis okay the corals provide zooxanthellae with the compounds necessary for photosynthesis what corals give to the zooxanthellae coral gives compounds that are helpful for the zooxanthellae to to carry out photosynthesis and in return zooxanthellae supply the corals with organic products of photosynthesis like carbohydrates which are utilized by coral polyps for synthesis of their calcium carbonate skeleton okay then zooxanthellae are also responsible for unique and beautiful colors of the corals okay zooxanthellae are also important for unique and beautiful colors of corals and how many types of corals are there generally the corals can be classified into two types okay there is stony okay shallow water corals okay stony shallow water corals the kind that build reefs okay then we have soft corals okay and they are deep water corals so the thing is shallow water corals are, they are stony or hard then deep water corals are soft corals okay that live in dark cold waters okay so these are the general two types of corals now let us understand what do we mean by coral reefs okay we have understood about corals let us understand about coral reefs so reefs begin when a polyps attaches itself to a rock on the sea floor then divides or bursts into thousands of clones okay the polyps cal uh, like calicles connect to one another creating a colony that acts as a single organism okay as colonies grow over hundreds and thousands of years they join with other colonies and become reefs okay then coral reefs cover less than 1% of the ocean floor okay they cover less than 1% of the ocean floor okay 
but they are among the most productive and diverse ecosystem on earth they are referred to as rainforest of the sea for their biodiversity okay this is a very important keyword they are known as rainforest of the sea for their biodiversity okay so that's an important point now what are the benefits of coral reefs okay we'll understand coral reefs like underwater cities that support marine life okay so according to the united nations environment program in short it is known as unep so according to the united nations environmental program they provide at least a half billion people around the world with food security and livelihoods okay then coral reefs also act as wave breaks okay between the sea and the coastline and minimize the impact of the sea erosion and according to a recent study of the university of queensland australia more life can be supported by dead coral remains than live corals okay then what is the protection status how in india we are protecting corals in india they are under schedule one of wildlife protection act 1972 it is very important information for prelims okay so in india they are under schedule one of the wildlife protection act 1972 what are the threats that the corals face climate change remains one of the biggest threat threats so climate change is the threat okay around the world this threat has been visible in bleaching of corals okay so we will understand what do we mean by bleaching of corals what do we mean by bleaching of corals okay so if you talk about coral bleaching it is a process during which corals okay under the stress from warm weather expel the algae okay algae means zooxanthellae that we have talked about okay algae means zooxanthellae okay so the thing is corals under the stress from warm weather expel the algae that give corals their brilliant colors and live in their tissues and produce their food okay so once the corals you know like expel algae so corals no longer get the food okay from zooxanthellae and they become colorless so then it is known as coral bleaching means corals expelling the zooxanthellae algae from within so the thing is corals no longer will be getting food they will no longer be getting the pigments that are giving them colors okay so the thing is they become colorless okay and at the same time this process is known as coral bleaching then if we talk about the great barrier reef of the coast of australia okay great barrier reef okay it has suffered six mass bleaching events due to warmer warmer than normal ocean temperatures and this has happened in the year of 1998 2002 2006 2016 and 2017 and now recently in 2020 okay so great barrier reef has seen six mass bleaching events okay then the great barrier reef is a unesco world heritage site and home to one of the largest collections of coral reefs on the planet okay then there is a technology that was recently in news okay which is known as biorock technology because recently you know like uh, to the coastal areas of gujarat the biorock technology was being implemented by you know uh, bombay natural history society if i'm not wrong so that particular technology was in news you know for long time you know in this year and last year so we will understand about biorock technology okay it is a method to restore it is a method to restore coral reefs using bio rock or mineral accretion this particular technology bio rock technology is also known as mineral acc accretion technology okay so what happens in this uh, technology what we do under this low voltage electrical currents through seawater is applied okay we apply low voltage electrical currents through seawater causing dissolved minerals to crystallize on structures okay so whatever dissolved minerals are there they will crystallize they will form a structure and they will grow into white limestone okay uh, its chemical formula is CaCO3 which will be similar to that which naturally makes up coral reefs and tropical white sand beaches okay then biorock also known as sea crate okay it is also known as sea crate or cement okay it is not cement it is not this cement okay it is not this cement it is this cement s-e-a cement okay so biorock is also known as sea crate or cement refers to a subst substance formed by electro accumulation of minerals that are dissolved in seawater okay 
okay so this is biorock technology so let us understand about plural translocation that was in news okay so like you know this particular topic why we are analyzing in detail because like you know national institute for oceanography okay so there is an organization that is translocating some of the coral you know like uh, coral uh, from a uh, coral habitats from one place to another place okay so that's why it was in new so we will understand about co coral translocation translocation means movement of one thing from one place to another place okay movement of something from one place to another place is known as translocation so the translocation of corals is is at a nascent stage nascent means beginning stage along the indian coastline and it is difficult and has not been very successful in india and pilot projects at various sites including lakshadweep islands and andaman islands have been undertaken to study the survival rate method and site of translocation and creation of high heat resistant coral colonies okay then transplant planted corals are more susceptible to storm surges and uh, bleaching from warming ocean waters okay so the thing is once uh, corals are translocated from one place to another place so they become more susceptible to storm surges so like they are under greater threat once they are translocated then experts are of the view that of a high survival rate it is important to translocate corals in a place with similar environmental characteristics such as depth current flow amount of light and pressure okay so that's all that i had to discuss for the day thank you so much for your time i hope it was a great learning session for you okay so i wish you have a good day ahead bye bye take care